Thank you all for coming. Um, this is a Phenomenology Crash Course. It's a three-part mini-course which we've done in association with the Philosophy Society and the Philosophy Department. Um, there'll be uh, two more lectures. Uh, one tomorrow where Dan Watts will be talking about Heidegger. And again on Friday we've got Peter Juice talking about Levinas. Uh, now we have Wayne Martin who's here to talk about uh, Phenomenology's beginnings and key themes. Great, thank you. Wow, this is so exciting. Uh, first of all, I just want to draw your attention to the uh, program here. It says, this crash course is intended to be an introduction to phenomenology for students with no prior knowledge on the subject. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, no, you must. Uh, so I want to thank Karina and Luke uh, for organizing this. Uh, they came and asked me to do a session for the uh, Society on Phenomenology, and it seemed like too big a topic to handle alone. Uh, and uh, so it seemed like a good idea to have this crash course. I think there should just be crash courses about, uh, about everything. Uh, the uh, not so sure now that I've tried to put something together it was such a great idea after all um, I can see lots of dangers one danger is there's a real temptation at this point I get an hour and a half uh, to talk about basic problems and founding figures uh, and it's well it's very tempting to be dogmatic okay, to try to just like load up as much as possible. That would be the most ultimately unphenomenological sort of mode to occupy. So I'm going to try to lay out some uh, information here and pass some of the things that I know or think I know about this tradition. Uh, but it all should be open for uh, discussion, and I'm going to try to leave a fair bit of time uh, for discussion as we, as we move forward. So look, I, I, data dump is my, the method I'm going to use here, but I don't want you to think that anything I have to say uh, here is in any way authoritative. Uh, okay, so here's my plan. Uh, the uh, natural first question, uh, what is phenomenology? I want to talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk today about two uh, founding figures. Uh, one is Franz Brentano, and the other is Edmund Husserl. Uh, we'll get on later this week to some other figures uh, in the tradition. So I get to actually the boring end, uh, the notoriously boring end of the tradition. So don't expect excitement here. Uh, to talk a little bit about Brentano and, uh, and Husserl, then I'm going to teach you some jargon. Phenomenology is like full of jargon, so we have to make sure we come away at least with some jargon. Uh, and then I'm going to talk very briefly about two case studies um, of the kind of investigation in particular that Husserl has in mind for phenomenological studies. I'm going to try to run through that. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but fairly continuously, um, although you should feel free to break in and ask questions. But then I'm going to stop at that point. We can have some discussion. Um, and then if we have time remaining, uh, I've come, come back point six here. I've put it in brackets because there's probably more than enough there already. But if we have time, uh, we can come back and talk a little bit about this idea of crisis uh, and the phenomenology of the life world. So that's my plan. Uh, so uh, start at the beginning, then, uh, with this question, what is uh, phenomenology? So uh, first thing to say about that, anything you say uh, in answer to that question is going to be controversial. Uh, it's like asking what philosophy is, only worse. Uh, the, but let's just start to demark a little bit of the terrain. I'm going to distinguish between what I call small p phenomenology and capital P, big P phenomenology. Uh, by uh, capital P phenomenology, I, I really mean the name of a particular tradition in mainly 20th century uh, European philosophy. As we'll see, it starts at the end of the 19th century, and it's still going today. I had a big quarrel at my last job about whether the phenomenology courses should be listed in the history of philosophy section or whether they should be part of the, you know, alongside philosophy of mind and ethics. And we won that, um, we won that fight. So um, I'm going to mainly today going to be talking about that tradition of phenomenology in you know, mainly continental European philosophy, uh, although it, you know, it, has its roots, uh, it has its roots earlier than that. And so here I've given a list of uh, some of the prominent figures. 
in that tradition. Uh, two of them I'm going to talk to you about today, Franz Brentano and Edmund Husserl. Brentano did not himself call himself a phenomenologist, uh, but he certainly gave shape to the uh, subsequent tradition. Husserl uh, and his student, Martin Heidegger, that Dan is going to talk about tomorrow. And then you can see moves from Germany to France there, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, Emmanuel Levinas, and then, uh, who knows, somebody in this room, although there's some contenders for the continuation of that uh, tradition. Uh, Logstrup is one, uh, the Michel Henry uh, would be another, uh, and then there are important contributors outside of continental Europe uh, as well. So that's the kind of tradition that I want to focus on. You can think of it as standing alongside traditions like structuralism or existentialism uh, in the context of 20th century uh, European philosophy. But then small p phenomenology is, uh, well, I call it here a philosophical project, and you, you don't need any proper names to talk about that. So the next question is, what kind of philosophical project is it? Uh, so let's talk uh, about that. Set aside these uh, bearded gentlemen for a while, and let's just think about that. I'm going to start here with an etymological clue. David's not here, so he won't quarrel um, with me, but he'd quarrel if he were here, I'm sure. Um, so just start with the word. I mean, we don't have to be bound to etymology here, but it's a useful place to begin. Uh, where does the word come from? Well, the two roots here, fine uh, and, and logos. Uh, so what does that tell us? Well, we're all familiar with the suffix of logos. Logos means word or reason, uh, then you know, meteorology, trying to find words to describe the weather, biology, trying to find words and reasons to describe the phenomenon of life. Uh, so we're kind of familiar with that. We think of it as a suffix that means the study of or the science of. So um, what's the fine part? Well, uh, fine comes from the root phus, uh, which is the Greek word for light. Uh, so as a kind of a rough first stab, you can say that small p phenomenology is the study of what comes to light. It's the study of what appears or what shows up, or we can say, well, phenomenology is the study of phenomena. Um, there's another chair over there if you want to sit down, or you can stay there if you prefer. Uh, the uh, so uh, so a, a phenomenon is an appearance or something something that appears something that manifests itself and phenomenology tries to study um, appearing in that way so that's the etymological clue uh, the second uh, clue I want to offer is what I call the standard textbook gloss. I've never actually found a textbook that says exactly this, but if somebody finds that, that would be really useful <laughs> um, for me. Uh, the, uh, and we even less, I mean, we don't have to be bound by etymology, still less do we have to be bound by the standard textbook gloss. But here it is. What's phenomenology? Uh, phenomenology is the descriptive science of consciousness, some people say. I think that's a kind of a common thought, uh, at least it's a first thought for trying to specify uh, what phenomenology is. Notice that there are the three clauses there. It's descriptive rather than explanatory, right? If we think about uh, psychology, for instance, it's trying to explain why we have the particular experiences we have, perhaps. Um, the, whereas phenomenology is going to say, okay, we'll just forget about that. Who cares about that? Uh, let's just focus on describing the experiences that we have. So it has a descriptive rather than an explanatory intent. And if you go back into the 19th century, you get um, in Biltai and some of these others a description. They're not yet using the term phenomenology, but they'll, they'll uh, contrast two kinds of psychology. Uh, that there's psychology that is explanatory and there's psychology that is descriptive. And you can really, I think, see the phenomenological capital P tradition as coming out of that distinction in Biltai. So one task is to try to explain causally or in terms of laws of nature, you know, why I'm having the experiences I'm having. But the phenomenologist says, no, wait a second. Okay, well, let's bracket that question. There's a bit of favorite phenomenological jargon. And we're just going to try to describe the experience that we have. Uh, second, in the standard textbook, oh, that's the descriptive clause, um, but then the idea of science, 
uh, descriptive science of consciousness, the idea there that somehow such an enterprise could itself be scientific, this ambition of phenomenology uh, to attain the rank of, uh, of a science. What kind of science is something that we're going to need to think about? And then that its object, its distinctive domain of investigation is consciousness. Why? Well, here we can link it back to the etymology. We're interested in consciousness because consciousness is the domain in which things show up, right? Phenomena, things manifest themselves in our conscious experience. So the phenomenology is going to take a special interest in what consciousness is. Um, okay, that's the standard textbook gloss. And now I just have to issue the warning, phenomenology kills. Uh, that's a different warning. Uh, the, the warning is that uh, the standard textbook gloss is dangerously misleading. Um, and if I forget to say why, let's talk about that in the discussion. I don't have a slide for that. Um, I think in a way there's something all wrong about uh, the, the, the standard textbook gloss, so we need to think about where it might be getting the, the, the matter wrong. Okay? Uh, so here's a quote from Husserl, Husserl at full throttle. There's another word I mean there, I couldn't, what is he like, gave it really going in a, in a, in a you know, rhetorical speech, you get to the crescendo of your speech. Here's Husserl at crescendo. Um, he says, um, with this we meet a science of whose extraordinary extent our contemporaries have as yet no concept. A science, it is true, of consciousness that is nonetheless not psychology, a phenomenology of consciousness, as opposed to a natural science about consciousness. So that's in this little essay called Philosophy as Rigorous Science, so you can see the ambitions of Husserl to science. And it's published in Logos One. It's such a fateful place. But it's Husserl's Manifesto, new journal underway, founded there in 1911. And the very first issue of this new journal, uh, Husserl publishes this manifesto, kind of call to arms for phenomenological investigation. Uh, now, one thing I just want to draw attention to here in that quote from Husserl is that there's a kind of a visceral motivation for the project. Uh, when it's framed in these terms. Mm -hmm. The crucial thing, the thought is, ordinary, empirical, natural science, psychology, physics, neuroscience, biology, whatever you want, it's left something out. I think that's a really crucial part of Husserl's conviction. Uh, the, the story that is told by the empirical natural sciences, it's not the whole story to tell. Um, and in particular, I think, as Husserl sees it, natural science is telling us something very... Husserl is not anti-science. He thinks science is the greatest thing, and he wants phenomenology to be science. But he thinks that empirical natural science is primarily, well, exclusively, trying to tell us how things objectively are. What's the objective nature of things? That's what science is so great at. But suppose you had the whole completed science. You had the whole count of the objective nature of things. You would have left something out, according to Husserl. Namely, you'd have left out, well, call it the science of seeming. Uh, what about the way things manifest themselves to us? There's something left out. And I think you'll find, we'll see some of this today, that a lot of Husserl's thinking revolves around this Tension, this complicated interaction between being and seeming, the is and the seems. A lot of his arguments, I think, uh, turn on that kind of connection. And his ambition is for phenomenology, if you will, to be a science of seeming. Uh, and you might think, wow, that's kind of, why would he be so concerned about the seeming of things? Surely what matters <laughs> is, the, uh, is the being um, of things. Yeah? Okay, that's the end. That's as far as I can get so far on what is, um, what is phenomenology. We've got, we got, we got the etymological clue, the logos of the phenomena, the science of the way things manifest themselves. Notice that that way of putting it does not mention the word consciousness 
We have the standard textbook gloss, the descriptive science of consciousness. That really makes consciousness the object by definition of investigation of phenomenology. And then we've got this Husserlian idea, too, of the uh, kind of science of the seeming. Okay. All right, so uh, with that, I want to turn a corner uh, and start to just uh, track a kind of a, a route through the history of big P phenomenology. Okay, and certainly the first figure we need to uh, think about there is this chap, Franz Brentano. Uh, so Brentano is an Austrian. You see his dates here, 1838 to 1917. I say here he's a defrocked priest. That might be slander. I'm not sure exactly what defrocked means. He was a priest, and then he wasn't a priest. Is that defrocked? That's what he was. He gave up the priesthood. I think under a certain amount of pressure, though, and that's related here to the other couple of points I put here. So, you know, as a priest, he's a, he's a philosopher. He's trained in the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition. I think it's very significant, actually, that the founding figure in this tradition is somebody who has his roots in Aristotle in his training. But he was, really, he was assigned to write an encyclopedia article on Comte, the uh, French positivist of the 19th century. And he got very interested in Comte, and I think he was uh, attracted to Comte's views. Comte is an atheist, <laughs> among other things. Um, the, uh, and, well, we don't know what happened next, but he wasn't a priest uh, <laughs> after that. Um, and the key book here is called Psychology from an Empirical Standpoint. Uh, the, certainly his most read work. Not his only work. He has some very important essays on Aristotle, um, and there's another book after this. But the one that really sort of made its mark is this book, Psychology from an Empirical Standpoint. Very important to remember here, this is the period, the end of the 19th century, when psychology is really kind of emerging as an independent natural science. The first chairs of psychology, the first actual empirical psychology labs, uh, are being set up about this time. And there's a huge scramble for resources to fund these. Uh, you know, who's going to pay for this new science? Even though psychology, in one way, is this very ancient discipline, right? I mean, it's been going as long as mankind, uh, or at least been going as long as uh, the history of Western philosophy. It's in Aristotle, it's in Plato. Uh, but this idea that psychology could become an empirical science is a characteristically late 19th century idea, and it has its epicenter in, uh, well, southern Germany and Austria. Uh, okay, so in tackling this uh, challenge, how can we make psychology empirical, Brentano starts out from what I'm going to call his demarcation problem. He says, okay, we're going we're gonna to do psychology here. Uh, we want to be really systematic. We're not just going to you know, repeat a bunch of uh, things we've been taught. No, we want to be scientific about it. Well, what exactly is it that psychology studies? Now, you might think that's easy, but it's not, actually. It's a really hard question. And if you look at the sort of long sweep of, um, of the history of psychology, it's one of these disciplines that's moved around a lot in terms of trying to figure out what it's supposed to study. When you think about in the 20th century, you get some people who say psychology is studying behavior, right? The behaviors, that's what the object of study is in psychology. Some people think psychology is primarily studying the brain. Uh, that's another kind of... Uh, if you look in the ancient world, what is psychology in Aristotle? It's the, it's the study of the form of the body, right? The suke. Uh, in in, in, in uh, Descartes, it's the study of the rational <coughs> subject. Right? So psychology has moved around a lot in terms of trying to figure out what exactly is it supposed to be studying. Um, and so Brent Thomas says, we better get straight about that um, first off. Now in doing so, uh, Brentano helps himself to a version of a kind of a characteristic modern dualism uh, that distinguishes between the mind and the world, between what I'm going to call the psychical and the physical. That's Brentano's preferred language for, for thinking about this. Uh, you, we, you know, we're most maybe familiar with that. If you're a philosopher, you're most familiar with that distinction from Descartes, right? The, is, the, is the thinking thing on the one hand, the mind, and then there's the extension, extended matter, uh, the world. 
And Brent, so Brentano is kind of operating in that tradition of modern dualism. But uh, Brentano's dualism is not a substance dualism. Remember, Descartes thinks there's mental stuff and there's physical stuff. There's thinking substance and there's extended substance. So Descartes's got a full-blown substance dualism kind of story to tell. Brentano, at least as I think about him, is, is he's not, he's not what I want to do metaphysics, man. We just want to do empirical psychology. So he's really trying to distinguish different kinds of phenomena, different kinds of possible objects of scientific investigation. We'll like suspend judgment about what their metaphysical status is, but let's just distinguish between the physical things that show up and then the mental things. That show up. So the lectern shows up, but so does my perception of the lectern. Those are two different objects uh, that we can make <coughs> objects of our investigation, two different domains of phenomena. So we've got a version of that characteristic mind body dualism, but I want to say it's a dualism of phenomena rather than a dualism of substances. We can suspend the metaphysical question <coughs> for now, but we still need to distinguish. Them, right? What exactly is the difference between these two domains? The mental things like my perceptions um, and the uh, physical things like the lectern. So how are we going to do that? So Brentano starts with an observation um, about this. He's actually resurrecting, I think, an ancient idea in a way but I'm not going to go into its back history. There's a famous footnote uh, in uh, the text where he goes through some of the history of this notion. But look, let's just start from the phenomena to the things themselves, as not all of like to say. Here are some examples of psychological phenomena. So I believe that Socrates lived in Athens. That's my belief. That's a psychological phenomenon. I'm afraid of the dark days ahead. That's another psychological phenomenon, my fear. And I love my cat. Those are three psychological states. So a really good, thorough psychology ought to investigate all of them. Now, the key thing here now is that Brentano notices a certain kind of formal feature, a structural feature that's common to these uh, three psychological states. Um, notice the common feature. My belief is about Socrates. My fear is of the dark days ahead. My love is for my cat. So that of, about, for structure uh, is uh, interesting, and it turns out kind of problematic. So let's give it a name. We're going to call that structural feature of these three psychological phenomena, psychological states, we're going to call that intentionality. Okay? Call that intentionality. Intentionality becomes... They're going to have central object of investigation in the early phenomenological tradition. <coughs> uh, so here, bold down at the bottom, uh, this sounds like a definition. Uh, a state is an intentional state insofar as it is of or about some object or state of affairs. Okay? So my belief is intentional because it's about Socrates. Uh, my fear is intentional. It's fear of the dark days ahead. My love is intentional. It's love for my cat. Okay, now here we come to Brentano's thesis. Some people call this Brentano's dictum. Yeah, you want to you really make a mark in philosophy. Come up with a dictum. Uh, so here's Brentano's thesis. He says intentionality, it's so important I put it in a whole bunch of different ways, but they're all basically doing the same, same thing. Intentionality is the hallmark of the mental or the psychological. That's the thing that's really special about psychological states. I'm going to put it in terms that my logic students here in the front row, all and only psychological states exhibit intentionality. That's a biconditional, right? That's a biconditional. You're going to find a set of intentional states and the set of uh, psychological states, exactly the same set, according to... Right now, I, know, I can see already all the counterexamples people are thinking of. Uh, bring them on. That's right. That's exactly the way we should be thinking. There's, that's the bold version of Brentano's uh, thesis. Or to put it another way, we can take all the phenomena there are, all the things that show up for us, we can divide them into these two categories. 
There's mind and there's world. There's psychical, there's physical, there's subjective, there's objective, there's intentional, there's non-intentional. Those are, that's the big sort of dividing line for Brentano in the things that manifest. And you know what? We'll leave it to these other sciences to investigate the lecterns and the, you know, the asteroids and all that cool stuff. And psychology is going to focus its attention on intentional phenomena. A crucial note here. Uh, notice that intentional in Brentano's dictum does not mean on purpose. We use people did that intentionally. You know, you, you did that intentionally. You did it on purpose or with intent. The, the two terms are related, but I'm not going to confuse matters by trying to specify their relation. Um, let's just treat intentional here as a, one of the bits of technical jargon in a jargon-laden field, and we're going to use it just to mean this other about this. Um, relationship. It's not that notion that we get in law and ethics about doing something with intent. Okay? People got that? Crucial to have a, a, a grip on the, on the notion of intentionality here because it's going to organize uh, the rest of the opening of the phenomenological tradition. I mean, look, what are you going to do with Brentano's dictum? One thing you can try to do is test it. That's what you ought to do, right? You ought to test it to figure out whether it's true or not. Are there psychological states that are not intentional? Are there intentional states that are not psychological? Um, let's talk about that in the discussion. But interestingly, after a little bit of discussion like that, that's not the way the conversation went. Because it turned out Brentano's dictum raised a much more troublesome question. But before we get to that, here's Brentano's most famous sentence. Uh, this intentional inexistence is characteristic of mental phenomena. No physical phenomenon exhibits anything like it. Boy, that's really going out on a limb. Um, that's from uh, psychology is an from, uh, from an empirical standpoint. I think it's uh, section five. Lots of people who read Brentano just read those two pages uh, from the book. They're definitely the most interesting two pages uh, that, that, Brentano, that Brentano wrote. Okay, notice here that Brentano does not himself use the term intentionality. That's a uh, accretion to the tradition by some of his students, and he had a lot of them, very influential set of students. He talks instead about what he calls intentional inexistence, the intentional inexistence of an object in an intentional state or in a psychological state. Now, there are two ways you might think about um, this notion of inexistence here. Um, this is, first one is not Brentano's way, although it's been kind of influential, mainly because of a really fantastic book by Roderick Chisholm, 1957. Uh, Roderick Chisholm, American philosopher, wrote a book called Perceiving, a Philosophical Study. And chapter 11 of Perceiving is called Intentional Inexistence. And he takes a version of Brentano's thesis, he puts it in the language of analytic philosophy, and it becomes a central organizing uh, claim in philosophy of mind in Anglo-American philosophy. Um, but look, I think it's useful to think about it Chisholm's way, um, although ultimately I don't think it was Brentano's way. But let's think about inexistence as non-existence for a minute. Look, maybe there are no dark days ahead, right? Maybe everybody's wrong about that. It's going to be all sweetness and light, and there are no dark days to come. Nonetheless, I am afraid of the dark days ahead, right? So my fear, my intentional state, can persist despite the inexistence of its object, the thing it's about. You see that? One of the things that's characteristic about intentionality is, to put it this way, it tolerates the non-existence of its object, right? That's one of the things that's kind of freaky about it, right? So if I'm taller than Batho, I think I am, like just a little bit, then both Batho and I have to exist, right? You can't be taller than somebody who doesn't exist. You have to have both of them. But my fear of the dark days ahead persists even if there are no dark days. So that's, one, that's part of the inexistence idea. In existence there would be non-existence. So it's characteristic, puzzling about intentionality, that it tolerates the non-existence of its object. But as I say, that's not exactly what Brentano meant by inexistence. 
He meant more like inside existence or within existence. In that historical footnote, his example, this is meant to clarify it. He says that his example is the way in which the Holy Spirit indwells in the church, right? <laughs> uh, that's like the, it's within it, right? It's already inside it. You know? It's very telling that in order to explain this, uh, this relationship, you appeal to the most mysterious thing ever, right? Uh, the, uh, so that's what he means by in existence. That somehow the dark days ahead, they're somehow part of my psychological state. That, that, that my psychological state is the state that it is in virtue of its having that content somehow as, as part of it. Okay, So that's what he calls intentional inexistence uh, in, his, in his formulation. And his claim is that kind of intentional inexistence is um, characteristic of psychological states. Okay, you can already begin to see um, intentionality is puzzling. And a lot of people have puzzled about it ever since. It's one of the great things. Who says there's no progress in philosophy? There's progress because new puzzles come on the scene. You know, there's a bit long stretch of philosophy when people think they're doing philosophy of mind, but they're not really puzzling about intentionality. That's progress from Brentano to put that on the table. So what are the puzzles? Well, here, I, maybe, I think I have three puzzles here. Uh, here's one of them. We've already mentioned it. Intentionality looks like a relation, right? I love my cat. That sounds like a particular kind of relationship between me and my cat. Right? We think about relations. Relations, as the logic students all know, they have a certain number of places. Love is a two-place relation. It's got to have one there, one there, two blanks in the predicate uh, in, uh, in a relation. And the, the things that go in the blanks are called relata, the, the relatum. One relatum, the other relatum, two relata. But one of the things that's puzzling about intentionality, it looks like a relationship. Grammatically, it behaves like a relationship. I love my cat. That's a two-place predicate. Uh, but it's a relationship that can obtain even without the existence of one of its relata. So I can be taller than Bob. Maybe it's not true. Uh, but he has to exist to be even one or the other. Uh, intentionality doesn't have that structure. So Ponce de Leon, my favorite example, he wants the fountain of youth. But you know what? There is no fountain of youth. Bad news for Ponce de Leon. But he can still have the desire. There's the intentional state. Looks like a relationship but it's a relationship that exists despite the non-existence of one of its relata. Now look, since the second relata need not exist, intentionality can't be treated as or reduced to a causal relation between Ponce de Leon and the object of his desire. So what I just said is so controversial, but it's meant to be kind of prima facie seductive. Look, if, if the fountain of youth doesn't exist, then I stand in no causal relationship to it, right? So, but if nonetheless I can stand in an intentional relationship to it, intentionality <coughs> can't be reduced to causality. That's a very short and very controversial argument. But again, it's, put it this way, it's a puzzle. What can the intentional relationship be? Uh, it doesn't look like causality. And that, if it's not, like causal, it's not a causal relationship, uh, then it has a problematic status in the causal world order that's described by natural science. Okay? A huge amount of uh, subsequent work has gone into trying to fit intentionality into the causal world order. Um, how are you going to do that? But that's not uh, what phenomenology does. Here we go. Let's, uh, oh, here's a quote from Husserl. Uh, this is kind of, I've taken one little bit of a long passage from this same philosophy as rigorous science essay. At one point in that, uh, in that lecture, uh, in that essay, uh, Husserl gives a list of five questions. Maybe I, should, I think I should read the whole thing. He gives this list of five questions that he thinks phenomenology ought to answer. Uh, this is 1911, Logos issue one. How can experience as consciousness give or contact an object? That's the one I've got here. That's a version of the intentionality puzzle. How is it that consciousness manages to be about something even if it doesn't exist? How can experiences be mutually legitimated or corrected by means of each other and not merely replace each other or confirm each other subjectively, strengthen each other subjectively? 
How can the play of a consciousness whose logic is empirical make objectively valid statements, valid for things that are in and for themselves? Why are the playing rules of consciousness not irrelevant for things? And finally, how is natural science to be comprehensible for everyone to the extent that it pretends at every step to posit and know a nature that is in itself? That's kind of his agenda for phenomenological investigation is to solve those puzzles. I've just put the first one here because that's the one I want to talk about today is uh, I think the most important one, the center of all the others is this puzzle about intentionality. How is it that consciousness, this merely subjective thing, manages to be about something that's not merely subjective? What kind of, what kind of uh, structure is that? And uh, who Schultz famous formula, all these questions become riddles as soon as reflection upon them becomes serious. Uh, I like that. All right. Um, the, uh, so here's the, third, here's the third puzzle about intentionality. What were the first two? It's, it's something that behaves like a relation, yet it doesn't require the existence of its second relatum. Um, the, it has this problematic place in the causal world order, so you've got to somehow solve that um, problem. Um, here's the third. Let's call it Brentano's Dilemma. So uh, let's go slowly here. Something very suspicious about this argument, I bet. Uh, you'll find lots of problems with it. Um, but let's suppose, with Brentano, that mental states are characteristically intentional. That's a weaker version than the dictum. You backed off of all and only, right? But let's just say they're characteristically intentional. So that's to say, a mental state is of or about some object. Now let's introduce a technical term. Let's just introduce the term intentional object to name that which, is, which a mental state is of or about. So my cat Andromeda is the intentional object of my love for my cat. Right? I'm just going to use that term intentional object. Whatever it is that my psychological state is of or about, call that the intentional object. The dark days ahead, that's the intentional object of my fear. I've forgotten what my other example was. Uh, Socrates is the intentional object of my belief. All right, here we go. Here comes the dilemma. Ask yourself, what is the ontological status of that intentional object? Where does it belong? Where do you put it on the map of kinds of beings? And in particular, here's the dilemma. A dilemma has the form of an either or. Is the intentional object itself mental or is it physical? Remember, those were, that's the way Brentano wants to divide up the world along with Descartes and everybody else. They want to divide these, all these moderns. There's the mind and there's the world. There's the subjective, there's the object. There's the psychical, there's the physical. Those are the two big categories. Uh, so where does the intentional object go? Which side do you want to put it on? And here are Brentano's options. Brentano himself oscillates on this question back and forth. Um, that, these are my terms for him. Let's uh, to take one, one kind of horn of the dilemma. We'll call it, I'm going to call it intentional realism. And intentional realism holds that the intentional object, that which an intentional state is of or about, is a real mind-independent object. So it's a, physical, it's a physical thing. It's part of the mind-independent world. Intentional idealism says the intentional object is some kind of mind-dependent object. It's an idea, it's a perception, it's a representation. Every figure in the modern tradition has some term uh, for that category of uh, mental thing. So those look like the two options. And in particular, if you're a Brentano, you've gone to all this work to divide the world up into these two bits. You've got to choose one or the other. You're going to have to fit the intentional object somewhere. Okay, so let's just think about the two cases in turn. You know, my cat is part of the physical world. Um, so it looks like the obvious place to land with this is on intentional realism. Uh, to say that the intentional object, you know, it's a real thing in the world. But it looks like the intentional object cannot be the real objective physical object. Why? Well, first of all, remember... The intentional object is essential to the intentional state. 
but the real physical object is inessential, right? In order to, uh, in order to have an intentional state, there's got to be an intentional object. That's just definitional. There's got to be something it's of or about. And that's essential to its identity as the intentional state it is. So the intentional object is essential, or it stands in an intrinsic relationship to the intentional state. But as we've seen, the real physical object is itself inessential. You can have that state even though there are no dark days ahead. So let's go back to Ponce de Leon. Ponce de Leon, he desires the fountain of youth in the worst possible way. Uh, so let's just think about, here's a kind of an intentional analysis of Ponce's de uh, desire. So the desire is itself the intentional state, right? That's the psychological phenomenon in Brentano's term. The fountain of youth, then, is the intentional object, right? That's the thing that his desire is of or about. So that's the intentional object. Of course, as we know, poor Ponce didn't know, there is no real objective fountain of youth. But the intentional object is essential to an intentional state. A state cannot be an intentional state if there's nothing that it's about. So it looks like the real objective fountain of youth is not the intentional object. Find versions of that argument um, in Husserl, in uh, Heidegger's uh, Lectures, Basic Problems of Phenomenology, Section 9. Uh, it's all over the place. Okay, that's the first horn, so let's go to the second horn, because intentional realism looked bad. It would look common sense, but realism is often kind of naive. So uh, we'll take the second horn, because the first horn looked impossible. Um, call that intentional idealism. Here we can think of it as the retreat to interiority. Since the intentional object is not a real physical object, it must be some kind of mental object. It's an idea, a representation, you can call it a perception. Uh, so strictly speaking, the intentional object of Ponce's desire is his idea of the fountain of youth. That's really, strictly speaking, the intentional uh, structure. And you can see that, that having an idea looks like, okay, that really is essential. Right? That's, that's got to be there in order for the intentional state to obtain. But that horn has these two uncomfortable consequences as well. Uh, one is skepticism. I mean, maybe skepticism is right. I'm very sympathetic to skepticism myself, one form or another. But it does, you know, some people are uncomfortable with that. It does have this problematic idea, not just that we don't have knowledge of the world, but in a way, our intentional states never even reach the world. They just get stuck in our mind, right? My desires, my beliefs, and so on, that which they get to, the object, the intentional object of those psychological states, is still inside the mind, right? There's some lovely paintings of that <laughs> um, the, uh, in the Dutch tradition, especially. So that's one, that's one uh, uncomfortable consequence. It's not necessarily an absurdity. Maybe that's just our situation. We're all stuck inside our own minds in that way. Incapable even of thinking of the world outside. Uh, the other problem, though, looks even more problematic. I call it phenomenological falsity. Falsity with a PH means false to the phenomenological facts, which is also spelled with a PH, okay? The, uh, there's something phenomenal. You, you got it all wrong here, right? Because remember, think again about Ponce de Leon. He want, what he wanted, what's the object of his desire, is not an idea, right? He already has the idea of the fountain of youth. That's not the problem. The thing he wants is the real fountain of youth, <laughs> okay? So we got the phenom we've gone all wrong. We've got the phenomenological structure. He already has the idea of the fountain of youth. What he desires is the fountain of youth. So get, telling him, okay, here it is. You give him a mental item. That's just not going to satisfy... Uh, de Leon's <laughs> desires, okay? So uh, it looks like that second form of, of the dilemma, even with its skeptical cost, it just gets the phenomenological facts wrong. There's a third position I know that some of you are already thinking about. Sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other. We can talk about that if you uh, are interested. All right, so that's Brentano's dilemma. We got it, Brentano's dictum. All and only psychological states are intentional. Brentano's dilemma, what's the status of the intentional object? Is it mental? Is it physical? And neither of them seem to really 
satisfy. Uh, uh, neither of them seem to really get the structure of uh, these dreams right. So what's the, what's the upshot of Brentano's dilemma? Really, I should leave it to you. This is a page that needs to be <coughs> written, but because this is a crash course, I'm going to fast forward to the most dramatic consequence I can think of. Here it is. Well, for, it's disputed. <laughs> Here we go. Here's my, strong, here's my strong conclusion. The modern, the familiar modern ontological disjunction between mental and physical, inner and outer, subjective and objective, private and public, those are all different names for the same thing, right, is inadequate for phenomenology. Now notice, I'm not saying it's metaphysically inadequate. You know, all these opponents of Descartes said, well, if there's the mind and there's the body, how do the two interact and all this stuff, right? The, where does it fit in? That's not the claim. Uh, leave the interact, leave the metaphysics to somebody else. We're just interested in the phenomenology. We want to describe the structure of experience, right? That's the phenomenological project. And if you're going to do that, like plan A, for the first thing you're going to have to explain is the structure of intentional experience. And uh, fast forward, most ambitious lesson from Brentano's dilemma is if you approach that task with this distinction between the inner realm of the mind and the outer world, between the psychical and the physical, the mind and the world, you're going to get the phenomenological facts wrong. At some point I said in a different way, same thing. If one insists on dividing the real into these two domains, (coughs) then one inevitably misrepresent the phenomenological structure of intentionality and hence of experience itself. I hope that's defensible. Um, the, uh, but you have to have a very much longer <coughs> course than this one in order to get to the bottom of it. The, uh, I mean, one thing you have to say about that is if that's, wor- if that's right, it's going to be a really, really difficult exercise in thinking and imagining to get over that distinction between mind and world, subjective and objective, inner and outer, private and public. Those are such entrenched categories for us that they're built into our language, they're built into our practices, they're just really woven into the way we think about ourselves and just about everything. You're not going to get over that quickly. Uh, It's going to be a real task of thinking uh, uh, in order to try to develop an alternative framework. Can I, can I be self-promotional here? I have a little essay called Bubbles and Skulls. Um, you can find a version of it on my website, uh, but there's a better version of it um, that is published in a, uh, the Blackwell Companion to Phenomenology and Ex- Existentialism, where I look at an artistic tradition that's trying to grapple with getting over those, um, those distinctions. Okay. Hey, there we go. I think I'm going on much too long. Uh, how are we for time? We're about 50 minutes in. Um, okay, well, um, that's good, because what I have to say now is much less worked out, uh, so I can say it more quickly. That, so we've seen Brentano. Brentano's kind of found a figure. He doesn't call himself a phenomenologist, uh, but he attracts a tremendous number of very influential students. One of them um, is Husserl. So let's look now at, uh, at Husserl. The, uh, so Edmund Husserl... Uh, 1859 to 1938. He's uh, born, I think, in Moravia. Is that part of the Czech Republic now? No? Uh, somewhere around there. Uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, the, uh, he's trained as a mathematician. I think this is actually, the background of these guys turns out to be really important, actually, for the way in which they do their phenomenology. So uh, Husserl is really a mathematician. Remember, at this period of the turn of the century, the first decades of the uh, the last decades of the last century, of the 19th century, first decades of the 20th century, <coughs> period of real crisis in mathematics, in particular about the theoretical foundations of the calculus uh, and the status of infinitesimals in, in mathematics. And Husserl goes to work on that. He's a student of the famous mathematician Weierstrass. He does a PhD on this hottest topic in mathematics of the day on the foundations of the calculus. Uh, and then he turns a corner. He goes to Vienna uh, to continue his studies. This is Vienna, right? I mean, this is Vienna 
this is the Vienna, right? I mean, this is Schoenberg, this is Freud, all of the possible things. This is the, the, uh, the secession movement. It's Klimt. So this is the most, if you can have your time machine, go there, right? The, um, so it's a place where you could easily be distracted from mathematical work, let's just put it that way. Um, but uh, Husserl is not distracted by Freud or Klimt or any of these people. He's distracted by Franz Brentano, okay, and this puzzle about intentionality. Uh, and he, but he starts on the kind of mathematical topic. Look, phenomenology's got to be interested in all these different kinds of experience. So he's got the spectrum in mathematics. He starts to work on the experience of number, right? Uh, so that's his first work. And he's really celebrated as the founding figure of the tradition. He becomes a kind of international superstar, as far as you can become that. You're not French. Uh, the, uh, so here's Husserl's major work. I can tell you, Husserl is a terrible writer. He's just a really terrible writer. The, uh, and he always things always get worse when he tries to edit his work. Yeah? The, so if you can find Husserl at the place where he has not edited his work, that's the place to read. Okay, um, so there are five big books. The actual corpus is just enormous of all of the knockoffs and so on. But here are the five main works. The first one, 1891, um, is this project in arithmetic. Um, he's at that point calling it psychological investigations, the psychology of mathematics. Um, then the really the kind of breakthrough work, what he calls the breakthrough to phenomenology, uh, comes in the logical investigations. It's a thousand pages long, um, and I say here. Uh, read the first edition, because in the, around uh, 1910 and 11, he started to re revise it, um, and it gets so much worse uh, under, under revisions. He's changing his mind, and uh, it gets even longer. Uh, so read, if you can get your hands on the, the first edition, that's the one, um, the one to read. And then kind of the central theoretical statement of his phenomenological position is in this book, Ideas. Uh, there are three volumes of it, but only one of them he published in his own uh, his own lifetime, a general introduction to pure phenomenology. Here my tip is, use the Boyce Gibson translation. There's a new translation that's very expensive by Kirsten, and it's just terrible. Uh, don't buy it. Uh, find Boyce Gibson's translation instead from the 30s. Uh, then in 1931, very important episode in the history of phenomenology, Husserl is invited to Paris uh, to give a series of lectures. It's a really big, by this time Husserl is really famous, uh, the, uh, he, the lecture is held in the Amphitheatre Descartes in the Sorbonne. Um, the German ambassador attends, and you know it's a huge public event. And everybody who's subsequently anybody in French phenomenology is there. A young Emmanuel Levinas gets assigned to make the kind of authoritative translation of his uh, of his lectures. Uh, so that's the Cartesian Meditations. Here my tip is, read the Paris lectures first, because there's a version of what he actually read. Uh, the, that text survives, and, and it publishes the Paris lectures. And then he went, and on the train back to Austria, he started revising it, and it just got terrible, terrible. Uh, so read the Paris lectures instead. And then the last thing we'll talk about later, uh, 36, bear in mind this is uh, you know, during the Nazi Zeit, uh, is the crisis of the European sciences. Um, so those are the five big books. The two things that I would really direct you to if you want to do some reading in Husserl, though, are these two short and I think really extraordinary essays. Um, and they're both uh, reprinted in this out-of-print book, um, but they're easily, they're easily available. Um, one is called Philosophy's Rigorous Science. That's the one I've been quoting from so far in this first edition of Logos. I call that the Manifesto for Phenomenology in 1911. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Um, and it's very argumentative. Uh, it really, really rewards careful study. Um, and the second, from 35, um, we'll talk about this if we have time at the end, is this, uh, what's called the Vienna Lecture, um, Philosophy and the Crisis of European Humanity. Uh, so those are, I think, two places, uh, both short things, both things that Husserl never revised, um, but are places to start. Okay, um, so I'm not going to get very far in Husserl studies here today, but let's just think about what he does with Brentano's dilemma. All of Husserl's, uh, all of Brentano's students are puzzling about this. Actually, one of the key breakthroughs is made by this Polish student of his uh, who's visiting in Vienna, Twardowski, Casimir 
Kordowski uh, is a key figure um, in this, but Husserl's the one who really kind of starts to work it out. So we want a solution to Brentano's problem. I put solution in quotes because in important ways he's shifting the terrain a bit. Um, so remember, the dilemma is that this kind of characteristic modern framework of subjective and objective doesn't look like it is adequate to describing the structure of our experience. So here we got our subject and object. Now look, tomorrow, is it tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow, Dan's going to tell you about a much more radical solution. Heidegger's going to say, we will talk no more of subjects, right? Heidegger's going to go much further than that. Husserl's solution is more modest. He's just going to add something else in, right? Instead of having a two-part metaphysical schema, let's have a three-part metaphysical schema. So instead of just having the subjective and the object, the private and the public, he wants to have this third kind of ontological category, call it the intentional content of experience. All right, now I've got a terribly crude and hokey example, but just like bear with me, all right? If I were better at technology, if Jeff had done this or Naomi, this would be like rocking, but this, this is just my bad, uh, my bad example. So I want you to think about the experience of approaching a distant mountain. In particular, what I want you to think about is the experience of driving north in California on Interstate 5 <laughs> towards the Oregon border. And as you get up near, Alan's smiling, he's been there, you get near the Oregon border, there's a volcanic mountain called Mount Shasta, and you can see it coming, or you coming towards it, for hundreds and hundreds of miles away, okay? So this is meant to simulate the, your, your experience of that. Here it comes. There it is in the distance. Look, there it's coming. There it comes. There we go. Hey, there it is. Wow, look at that mountain. Now, actually, there's something crucially wrong. I mean, there are many things wrong with my simulation. But one actually turns out to be very important. As I got closer, because it's the same photograph blown up, it got blurry. You notice that? But if you were really getting closer, what would happen? It would resolve into more and more detail. Okay? So, now, just use your imagination. You can do phenomenology with imagination. You can take real cases. But let's just take this imagine. If you want something more mundane, just walk towards that chair, right? Okay, there it is. And think about the form of that experience. Uh, the, uh, so what, uh, what happens? How should we describe the intentional structure of that experience? Well, okay. We've got our tripartite metaphysics now. Part of the story is me, right? I'm the subject here. We still have subjects until tomorrow night. Uh, the uh, part of the structure here is me I'm moving along the highway with constantly changing private conscious experience Right? that's one of the things that Husserl really really emphasizes you have this experience of a stable world but if you really attend to the actual conscious experience you'll find it is constantly changing there's no identity in the private conscious of experience. So he calls that the subjective flux of experience. It's Heraclitean flux. Nothing remains uh, the same. So I'm cruising along there. There's no identity in my experience. It's just a constant, constant change. On the other hand, there is this thing that's staying the same, right? That's Mount Shasta. It's an enduring mind-independent object up there. That thing is remaining the same. But then, crucially, there's this third thing that Husserl wants to call the intentional content of my experience. What is it? Well, look, you can describe it at various different levels of abstraction. Part of the content of that experience is its experience of a mountain. Or you can be even more general than that. It's experience of an enduring object. Or you can go down into more narrow uh, uh, descriptions. You can say it's an uh, experience of a mountain that I'm getting closer and closer to, or of an isolated mountain. You can, you can describe it at any different level of, uh, of specificity or generality that you want. So the intentional content of my experience, let's call it the form or the shape of my unfolding private conscious experience, in virtue of which it presents me with an enduring object that I'm steadily approaching. 
Okay? And if we did that run up to Mount Shasta again, we'd have another instance of the same form. That's not to say we'd have exactly the same subjective experiences, because those are constantly changing, but it would, we would re-instantiate that form approaching an enduring object at a more or less steady pace. And what's happening, go back to those examples in my hokey slides, right? It's filling up more and more of my visual field. And the thing that didn't get represented in my slide is coming into crisper and crisper view. Those are forms of experience. That's a kind of the shape of my experience. And my private conscious experience, with all its flux, is instantiating that form. And it's in virtue of its having that kind of form that it manages to present me with an enduring object, with the thing that it, the object that it presented to me. Okay? So that's the third thing that Husserl wants, intentional content of experience. It's a shape, it's a kind of organizational structure. Husserl is really a kind of a cognitivist or cognitive scientist. He thinks it's almost like a set of instructions that you can program into a computer. Right. Uh, the, uh, it's, an, it's a set of rules, in a way, for locating the object that you're having an experience of. So one benefit of this model is that it provides a solution to Brentano's dilemma. How's that going to work? Well, look, what Brentano wasn't able to do, he couldn't capture the intentional structure of experience because all he had was subjects and objects, mind and matter, right? Uh, private and public. Here we've got that we can distinguish the subject from the object, but now we've got this other distinction between the content and the object of my experience. Those are two different things. So the object of experience is typically a real mind-independent object in the world. So that's Mount Shasta, right? That's what my perception is a perception of. And that was the crucial kernel of truth in intentional realism. You are not, the good news, you are not trapped within your own minds, right? Intentional realism had that kernel of truth to it. The intentional object can be, and in my arriving at Mount Shasta is, a mind-independent object. But that object of experience, the object of experience is not essential, right? That's not the part that's essential. In order to have an intentional state, you need intentional content, but you don't always need an intentional object, right? That's where you can split the difference in Brentano's dilemma. So we get a real object. The real object is not intentional. So sometimes I want the last beer in the fridge, but Bacco drank it. Yeah? So the object's not there, but the content remains. So then the content of experience, that's what presents an object in a particular way, right? So the form that my experience is taking as I approach the mountain is presenting me with a particular kind of object in a particular, in a particular way. Now, the intentional content is essential to intentional content. You can't have an intentional experience without intentional content, according to Husserl. It's the form or the shape of consciousness. That's the kernel of truth in intentional realism. But, okay, crucially for Husserl, it's not itself a mental item. It's not a private item. And you know what? Karina and I can both have experiences of the same form, with the same intentional content. We can drive together up towards Mount Shasta. Of course, our private experience is going to be slightly different. They're not going to be exactly the same. That's the subjective flux, but the intentional content can be the same. So it's not an object in my mind. It's not an object in Corinne's <coughs> mind. It's somehow something that we can have in common. So it's public, but it's not objective. It's not an object. It's a form. He's a Platonist. He always denies that. But in a way, he's a Platonist. There are truths about these abstract forms of experience. So it's, a, it's not a private mental item. It's an abstract form or shape that can be shared by many different experiences. I'm past an hour. You guys are so patient. Um, so let me just try to go quickly through the last parts of this. Um, the object of study in phenomenology, then, uh, with that kind of framework, Husserl can pick out his object. He says the, the Husserlian phenomenology is the study of the intentional content of conscious experience. That's what we should focus on. He has different names for that. In 1900, 1901, he calls it the intentional species. Uh, in ideas, he feels like he needs to introduce the special term, the noema, 
uh, in order to describe it. That's what we're going to be investigating. Um, notice that the intentional contents of experience is not itself a natural object in the world. It's not lo the form of our experience is not located in space and time. Um, when, when it gets instantiated, it's lo that, that instantiation is in space and time, but the, experience, the form is not. So it's not a natural object. It's not investigated by physics or any natural science, according to Husserl. So we need a separate science for it. Uh, but neither is the intentional content of experience a private conscious state or a neural event. So it's not investigated by psychology um, either. So phenomenology is an independent science, according to Husserl. Give us a grant, right? Uh, <laughs> investigating the distinctive structures or forms in virtue of which consciousness presents a world. Okay, so out of Bertano's dilemma, you get this carving out of the object of study. Um, all right, uh, for some must-know jargon. Since I'm so late on time, I'm just going to show you jargon, and then maybe we can come back and talk about some of it. Uh, so this is how to bluff your way through a cocktail party with New Surlians. Uh, let me say, the, uh, just use these words. You know, you say, don't you think you're confusing the eidetic and the transcendental reduction? And then you say, let them go. Uh, so let's see, can I spend, I'll spend two minutes uh, on this. Real, real, ideal. You have to know how to pronounce it, right? Yeah, I don't get mistaken. The, uh, she'll show yourself up for sure. Uh, so real, real, these are three ontological categories in a way, right? Real objects is like this. Right? A real object occupies space and time. Real, I don't know where he gets this term. Real is the subject of the flux bit, right? That's the stuff that's like always changing. That's the private part that's just, in some sense, mental, exclusively mental, private. And then ideal is this other stuff, right? Um, the content of experience is an ideal structure. Bear in mind, he's a mathematician. He has no problem with ideal structures. You can study ideal structures, and that's what phenomenology does. So those, in a way, are the, that's one of his many names for these three kind of ontological structures. The epoche, if you want to study, oh, epoche means to cut, right? If you want to study the intentional content, then cut away this other stuff. In particular, just cut away the object. We're not interested in that. It doesn't matter whether Mount Shasta is there or not. The form of my experience is still the form that it is, and that's what we want to study. So engage the epoche. Cut away this other stuff about the world. Even all of the things you think you know from empirical natural science, that's not our concern here. We're going to focus in on that ideal, uh, ideal content. Uh, so those are a couple that emerge immediately. And the reduction is another way of putting it. The reduction is this incredibly complicated procedure that uh, Husserl thinks is absolutely vital in order to get the right kind of thing into view for phenomenological. So you've got to you start with the richness of your experience. And you've got to focus in on that intentional content. My favorite photographs of Husserl, you can see he's got his pen in his hand, right? And he's trying to write down the intentional structure of his experience. That's the, the frame of mind of the uh, reduction. There's endless discussion uh, among the commentators about exactly what the reduction is. Merleau-Ponty famously says, it's impossible. Uh, I'll come to some of these others in my examples. And if you want, you can ask, we can talk about it later. Um, so let me just stop with two very, very brief case studies. Uh, one is incredibly dumb, and the other I don't know how to finish. Okay, um, but uh, so philosophy, phenomenology is an infinite task. Um, so here's the beginning of an infinite task. So here we go. Here's one uh, example. Um, you're supposed to say a cube, right? Uh, what shape do you see here? What's the uh, what's the object of your experience? Uh, is a cube. But now let's just draw a line around that shape. Can that show up? Yeah. There's a green line around that shape, and then let's take the other picture away. Um, and it looks like, wow, what is that, a hexagon or something? Um, so now our question changes. So when you see, the, you see that again? Isn't this cool? Look at this. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, so now our question is a new question. How is it that this hexagon presents us with a cube? The shape that's there on the screen is a hexagon, and yet our experience is, has the intentional structure, experience of a cube. Right? There's a topic for phenomenological research. Husserl's answer, at least part of it, is that the way that works 
is that what I'm presented with here is not only this view of this object, but I'm also I'm adumbrating a horizon of, I love this language, this is beautiful Husserlian jargon, I'm adumbrating a horizon of determinately indeterminate further possible views. Okay? How is it that that view presents you with a solid object? It's because what you're presented with is not just the thing that you're actually seeing, the given in your experience, but what's given with you is kind of a horizon, the edges, the penumbra, he says at some time, of further possible views. So in particular, if you were to go around there, you'd get another view of the same object. It's determinately indeterminate, because we know it would be a primary color, but we don't know what color it would be. We know it would be a certain shape, but we don't know what color it would be. So that's the determinacy and the indeterminacy. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, bits of jargon there, I think, nomadic explosion, if I go around the other side and there's nothing there, um, I'm going to be really surprised. Uh, <laughs> it's really important to pay attention to that surprise. One of Husserl's examples, uh, Vienna going into a department store, you see a mannequin. You don't just see the face of the mannequin. You, it adumbrates a range of further possible experiences of the same thing. And if it sneezes, that's nomadic explosion, right? It did not fulfill the adumbration, okay? So in order to understand the structure of your experience, you've got to pay attention to these adumbrations. What are the further experiences that are projected over the horizon of the present experience? The modality of that, if you're a logician, the modality of that is really, really interesting. I don't have to go, I may never go around the other side, right? It's a counterfactual structure there that's built into the content of perceptual experience. Okay, the other really famous, really important topic is the topic of time. Uh, the, uh, I hope we're going to hear something more about that tomorrow. It's really hard. Husserl had this way of like farming out his work to his students, and uh, uh, he was working on time. First he gave it to Edith Stein, but then she got a job someplace else, so he handed it to this guy named Martin Heidegger in order to prepare it for a publication. If you ever have a manuscript you want to have prepared, don't entrust it to Martin Heidegger. That's the wrong thing to do. Uh, so we have this, this uh, text of this lecture course. Um, I think I'm not going to go through that. Um, I think maybe I'm not going to go through that in detail because we've already talked for a long time and it's warm. And I want to hear some, um, hear some discussion. So let me stop at that um, and open the floor. Yeah, Luke. Yeah, that's sort of, sort of, I guess the most obvious thing when you think of an intentional state, um, but with something that doesn't seem like an intentional state, doesn't seem to be about something, is um, an emotional state. So I can just be frustrated, and it seems like I'm frustrated about nothing in particular. Yeah. Um, how well then I look at everything else might be affected, but I think the frustration is the force for many objects. Yeah. How would an, uh, a phenomenologist try to deal yeah, with Yeah, good, good. Well, you're onto something really, really important there. Um, so, in, so that's uh, that's a, a suggested counterexample to Brentano's dictum, right? Uh, as, a, as a start, that looks like a case, something clearly a psychological phenomenon, and yet it lacks uh, it lacks intentionality, it lacks of of or aboutness. Uh, certainly, I mean that you can be frustrated about something in particular, right? So frustration can be intentional, right? But what you have in mind is something different. There are cases of intentional frustration, but there's some cases where, damn it, you're just frustrated and there's no particular object. Of, maybe there is an object and you're just not aware of what it is, right? And you need some help in order to tease that out. So you might not be aware of the thing that is the object of your frustration. I think, in fact, that's often the case, right? So, in fact, Brentano's dictum might be a kind of useful thing the, in, in the pursuit of self-knowledge. Look, I've got this psychological state. doesn't seem to be about anything, but you know what? I mean, there's got to be something there, and then we can try to investigate what it is. That's one way to go. Um, it's hidden from view. Remember, the, Breton is an exact contemporary of Freud, so there's something that's hidden from view there. That's a perfect possibility. Uh, another structure, what Heidegger is going to say about that tomorrow when he's here, the, uh, is he's going to call that a mood. 
Uh, and Heidegger's view is that moods are intentional. Or at least this is my version of Heidegger's story. You might want to put it this way. Uh, I, I think Heidegger does think that moods are intentional. And, but sometimes what they are, their object is, an, is, you know, the intentional object is some object or state of affairs. But sometimes they are something more like the structure of your world. Um, and for him, anxiety is going to be the central example of that. So sometimes psychological states have a different sort of intentional structure. Anxiety is something that discloses the structure of your, uh, of, of your world rather than any particular object. And one kind of bit of evidence for that is that oftentimes moods have this curious counterfactual character to them. Because if I'm frustrated, right, if I'm frustrated, it doesn't actually matter what comes into my world, I'm going to be frustrated about that as well, right? The, uh, anything comes, somehow you manage to get out of this, thank God, occasionally. But if you're really in a bad mood and you're really frustrated, everything frustrates you. That suggests that the intentional object there is not any particular object, in fact, but it's somehow the structure of your whole umwelt, your, env your environment as a whole. So those are two different ways you could go. Either you say, you know, in, in a kind of strictly Brentanian way, you say there's got to be an object, and it's, it's just you don't, you're not aware of what it is. Or in a Heideggerian way, you think about it as a mood, and what the, intention, the intentional correlate now is not exactly an object or state of affairs, but something about world uh, structure. World structure uh, is one of Heidegger's central concepts. I'm sure we'll hear more about that tomorrow night. Yeah. Isn't this exactly like uh, you know, suggest that the intentional structures construct its objects, like and, uh, and make the object meaningful uh, or accomplished? Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. Um, the I, I left that part out because <laughs> I'm trying to kind of suppress that. In fact, um, so the the term the key term you just used there is construction of the object. Um, so go back to the Rubik's cube, right? Um, how do I? So what I'm presenting there is that's a two-dimensional surface that's you know in front of us. It's a hexagon as it's out in at least in an outline, and yet somehow in experiencing it, we construct a three-dimensional object out of it with colors that are not even presented to us here. So that's you know that's the nomadic structure of the experience. So Searle thinks of it as a set of rules. You could program into a computer for constructing uh, the object that is presented there. So it looks like part of the structure of experience is essentially constructive. Um, and then you see there's a, very, there's a slide that comes very quickly at that point. Because if you say the structure of experience of objects is constructive, then you could just change around and you say the object of experience is constructed. <laughs> Um, and from there, it's a very short step to transcendental idealism. And that is the position of ideas. Uh, Husserl changes around. In Göttingen, in the logical investigation, he's a die-hard realist. But by the time you get to ideas, and he takes very seriously this idea, the object is constructed. Even the subject is constructed. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a version of the thesis of transcendental idealism. Yeah. Like here, um, I can identify that in the cube. Uh, I think just because I have seen it uh, already in my experience, or, or somebody must have, you know, talked to uh, Good. me about that, right? So I wonder if, using Brentano's um, terminology, if this is a desire of actually my own experience of my own self rather than an object. If uh, I was somebody who, when never seen. Cube. Yeah. I would see maybe three colors or something yeah. else. And it's the same with the fountain of you. I mean, with the example, if, yeah. you know, I can imagine it and I can desire it only if I have seen it or experienced it. Um, otherwise, it's just, uh, yeah. Right, good. Uh, yeah. So I wonder if, if there's a solution. So where does it come from, right? How is it that I'm capable of seeing a cube when presented with a, this hexagonal shape? The, um, here one wants to go back to Diltai's distinction. Erklärende und descriptiven Psychologie, descriptive and explanatory psychology. 
There's a perfectly legitimate object of investigation here, which is how did you come to do this? That's a seek, seeking after causes and antecedents. You want to explain it, they're clear. Uh, that's fine, do that. But what phenomenology wants to do is say, well, who, first bracket that, right? Epoche, reduce that, and let's just focus on the question of what's the descriptive content um, here. The, uh, so there's a kind of a division of labor on this, on the, uh, on the Husserlian story. Go on, yeah. I understand, but we still have to agree that that is a Q. Maybe it's not. How can we agree? Yeah. If, you know. Okay, good. Well, well, why do we have to agree? Uh, part of what Husserl is going to say, this is the epoche and the reduction. We're not trying to seek agreement about what the world is like, right? That's a different question. This is the way which is a really fundamental shift of topic. After, I mean, this is really part of the history of post-Kantian philosophy. Rather than trying to get at a story about what the world is really like in itself, this is an investigation of the structure of our, uh, of our experience. So we don't have to agree about what the world is like. Maybe there is no world. You can still do phenomenology because you can still have this task of trying to understand what's the structure of my experience such that it presents the world as it seems to be for me, as an enduring object of attention. Uh, so we don't, it seems to me we don't have to have agreement about whether it's really a, really a, a cube or not. That's the line. I don't know how much this was covered earlier, uh, but uh, we said it was mainly, it's supposed to be descriptive uh, rather than explanatory, but would it be sort of fair to suggest that particularly once you talk about Husserl's notion of uh, intentional content, <coughs> it lends itself to sort of a Kantian notion of transcendental subject? Yeah, um, that's right. I think that Husserl, well, okay, um, this is a very delicate matter, and it's sort of an embarrassing matter for Husserl. Um, so what about the subject? of experience. This is about the object of experience, and you know, Michelle goes to work on that. Uh, what about the, you know, the representing I? Uh, in the first edition of The Logical Investigations, Volume 1, 1900, um, he, there's a passage about this, and he basically there takes a Humean line. There is no subject of experience. Look within, you're just not going to find the subject of experience. You find intentional content, you're presented with objects, but there is no subject. I've looked and I don't find a subject of experience as a feature. Of Second edition, 1911, there's a footnote to that passage that says, I've subsequently found it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and, and, and in particular, I mean, this is related to the point about construiren. Um, once you have this, uh, this structure of construction as part of the essential dynamic of uh, even the presentation of objects as the objects that we experience them as being, the kind of correlate of that is a version of the transcendental subject. Uh, so by the time you get to ideas, you've got a, a, I mean, it's already there in, in 1911 in the uh, in the sec, in the revisions to the first edition of Logical Investigations. Um, he's got a subject. Subject. I mean, I might, this is one of the things I'm most interested in myself as a kind of a working phenomenologist. What's the phenomenology of self consciousness? That has actually been the hardest question, or it's like up there with the top three hardest questions in phenomena. Time is one of them. Time has been an incredibly difficult topic, although people have made some real progress with it. How is it that I am I'm presented with a uh, you know an objective time relationship? How does that manifest itself in my experience? You know, my experiences don't come with date stamps on them, and then you could somehow put them in order, but somehow I managed to construct an objective time determination. That's a really, really hard problem. And uh, both Husserl and Heidegger think that it requires a kind of another revolution in order to solve it. Brentano Salemo, as we get over this subject-object ontology, and if you're going to make progress with the time problem, you're going to have to get over this idea that time is a sequence of now moments, that the, the real is the present, the, the, the metaphysics of presence is the real thing, and somehow you construct durations out of that. In, in, uh, one thing that's clear in Husserl's account of time is that durations are the primary temporal manifestations. And when you talk about instants of time, you're just talking abstractly. You're abstracting from what's actually presented in conscious. And of course, Husserl, I mean, Heidegger's book is called Being and Time, right? I mean, he's got a very elaborate story to tell about the structure of time. 
Um, so that's been a very difficult topic, um, although one on which there's progress. This, uh, the, the, the phenomenology of the self is, I think, a much, much more difficult one. Partly there's Hume's problem, right? Look within, you know, examine your experience. Don't, what is the I in my experience? What, uh, what, what, structure, uh, what structure is that? Um, the, uh, and Husserl, as I've already indicated, kind of struggles <coughs> over, um, over this question. Heidegger, in some of his passages, it really sounds like he also subscribes to this, you know, there is no real I experience in, in, the, uh, in the story. So, um, the, uh, yeah, it's one that's been a very difficult, um, a very difficult topic. In my own, just to give you one little clue, to more self-promotion, okay, the, uh, there's another paper on my website, that I, I find paintings actually very useful for this. The Bubbles and Skulls paper is about the phenomenology of self-consciousness. Um, and uh, I have another paper about uh, some of you seen that painting on my office door of Cronach's painting of Eden because um, one of the things to remember about Eden, you'll remember is that Adam eats the apple and then he feels shame uh, shame is a form of self-consciousness uh, so trying to think through what happened in Eden and what happens in Cronach's paintings is uh, another way to try to get it uh, phenomenological, uh, the phenomenological structure of self-consciousness. Uh, but it's a hard, very hard problem. Thanks for coming. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. You set out what kind of knowledge or knowledge basically descriptive as to which boundary. But once you've this this divide between three parts between you know, the subject, the content, and the object, are you then not simply explaining the link between the content and the rest, yeah, rather than good. simply describing the content? Yeah, good, good, good. No, that's a fair, that's a fair question. Um, and I think it's hard to, I mean, what's an explanation, right? Um, I think that the main thing that um, uh, even Diltai already was trying to rule out there was causal explanation that you explain something by citing its causes, um, or nomological explanation, where you exp explain some natural event by subsuming it under some law of nature. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, in German, erklären, um, you know, explanation, the root there is klar, to make it clear. <laughs> and there's some notion of explanation which certainly is, uh, is relevant here. You're, you're clarifying makes sense, you're solving some of the puzzles uh, about it. Uh, the, uh, so yeah, in some sense I think it is, uh, it does have explanatory content. But they're really, I mean the, the founding figure, this is something that you're going to find shifts over the course of this tradition, the founding figures are really quite vehemently anti-naturalistic. And, and in particular what the, the, the key term that comes into this period, anti-psychologistic. That's not to say they're against psychology, psychology is fine, let's do psychology. But the kind of inquiry that we're doing in this branch of philosophy needs to be separated from psychological investigation. Uh, whether they're entitled to that or not is an open question. These days, one of the kind of movements in phenomenology is what people call neurophenomenology. Uh, it's a really good collection of papers. Well, it's kind of a, mid a mixed collection of pa papers, but there's some very good things in it, uh, of, of papers recently in the last 20 years or so that have tried to use uh, phenomenology uh, in, in, uh, alongside uh, neuroscientific investigation. Jeff Yashimi uh, is a very good uh, person who's doing that. In the, in the, Daniel Dennett also is another person who's, um, who's done that. But the founding figures are ones uh, really who want a, really a sharp divide um, there. And Husserl, you'll find, actually one of the things I really like in uh, that essay, Philosophy is Rigorous Science, Husserl has an argument there which is meant to show that phenomenology cannot be um, a natural science. Because basically the shortest version of the argument is this. The, uh, if you're going to do natural science on an object, what does natural science do? It tries to get at the being by abstracting from the semen. Right? Galileo is the greatest you know, breakthrough uh, in this project. You set aside the apparent staticness of the earth, the appearance of stasis of the earth in order to realize that it's actually in motion. You're getting at the being by abstracting, suspending the semen. 
But that means in order to be, if you, if you accept that premise, that's what natural science is doing, then only a certain kind of object is an appropriate object of natural scientific investigation. To be an appropriate object of natural scientific investigation, it has to admit of the is-seems distinction, right? Phenomena are mere seeming. They don't admit of the is-seems distinction, so they're not an appropriate object of natural scientific investigation. There's a similar story in Crisis about the life world. Uh, the life world is saturated with meaning and value. Science, natural science subtract, abstracts from all of that in order to try and get it the way it objectively is. Uh, but if you do that, that's fine. You'll get a scientific account, but you'll miss the life world. Right? You'll miss the target of investigation um, there. So it's really that distinction between uh, natural science, empirical natural science, and these phenomenological investigations that they're after. And the Eclairon, this ex explanatory, is one way of trying to get it. That's mainly built tides distinction. Can we stop? We should, we're just on time. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you.